going to pray and we're getting back into a new series that's an old series so I'll explain that in a minute but let's pray together Jesus thank you for today thank you for the chance to be in your presence to be in church together to worship you because you are worthy of our worship God and I pray as we get into your scriptures may we be led and directed by your spirit to teach us the things that we need God in our lives and we thank you for what you're going to do in advance in Jesus name amen First of all, if you're a guest, we're so glad God has brought you here with us today. Uh, we believe God brought you here. It's not by coincidence. We never believe in coincidences. And so we're just praying that you especially get a special word from him uh, and see the purpose he brought for you today. Listen, today we're getting back into a special series that uh, we're, we've been in in Romans. And uh, it's a series that we actually started in 2016, uh, but I knew 
you, like there is 16 chapters in Romans and I figured it would take us at least 32 weeks to get through that whole book. And I knew what would kind of happen if we just tried to take a big bite out of this book all at once. And that is this, we would start out strong and then we would start really just rolling and rushing through stuff just to get done. And, uh, and I would have done that. I, and I don't know if you would have wanted me to do that, but I know I would have because I was just wanting to get on to the next thing and, and feeling like we were stuck forever. So I'm really glad that we didn't do that. Instead, what we've done is we've taken a certain amount of weeks every year and we've taken a bite out of this book and we're going to keep doing that till we're done. And, uh, and that's been really beneficial. It's been really helpful. Uh, we've grown a lot through this series. Uh, listen, <laughs> we have already gone gone through 28 weeks in the series. Isn't that crazy? (laughs) We just got to chapter 12. So we've been through 28 different messages as we've uh, really walked through Romans. Uh, We ended last year by looking at Romans 1 and 2, which are really foundational verses in the New Testament. They're they're solid and and they're really important. This year in our um, spiritual gift series, we covered verses three through eight. So we're not going to cover them again because even though it wasn't in the Roman series, it was in the next verses that we are in this. But we just covered it in, in the gift series. So we're going to start today in verse nine. But let me give you a little context because up to now in the book of Romans, Paul in the first 11 chapters has gone through great pains to really kind of explain like the nature of our lives and how messed up we are with sin and how we try to handle with that messed up sin nature. I mean, some people, they just give in and they just, they just go crazy with sin and they just live their life embracing sin full head on. Others people, they become religious and they think like, okay, well, I can make up for all the bad I did and my good can outweigh the bad and eventually I'll make it in. And in Paul, he spends 11 chapters basically deconstructing all of those thoughts, letting us know how wretched we are as sinners and that our only hope is in Jesus, a savior. And so that's what he does for these 11 chapters. And then it gets to chapter 12. And, and now we take a turn in this book in, in chapter 12 because now we begin to look at really what life lived out in the response to the gospel looks like. Like now that you're saved, our lives should look differently than they did before we were saved. And that's what he's going to really spend the rest of our time on. But he, I wanna, he sets us up by verse one in chapter 12. And even though we looked at it last year, I want to go back to that. It says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as the living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. And so for you and me who are Christians, the way we're to be living our lives is to be not for ourselves, but it's to be in worship to Jesus. This is why a Christian's life should look different than the rest of the world because we're worshiping God with our lives and we're living out a life of worship to God. And so on one hand, really living out our our faith for God is incredibly practical. I mean, if you've been a Christian for a while, you're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. And like, yeah, this is a better way to live. I get that. And there's, there's this one sense that it's incredibly practical. But on the other hand, it, it seems to cut against the grain of how we want to live, right? So there's this tension that we walk out in our lives as Christians. And so uh, in our passage that we're going to study today, we're going to be looking really at those that are closest to us. And next week, we're going to like look and talk about loving our enemies. So um, hopefully you'll come back next week because that's just as important as this week. Uh, but we just don't have enough time. Now, you would think that loving our friends would be the easier side of it. And, and it may not be as easy as you think. Because, listen, there are a lot of things that Paul's going to walk us through, a a whole big list of insights on what God kind of love looks like. And you're probably going to realize that you're not doing all of them. (laughs) And that's a good thing because that helps us wake up to the conviction of the Spirit of God in our lives so that we can get on His page and love the way He's called us to love. Now, listen, there's an important reason why you and I struggle with love, and it's because of sin, right? And, and sin was a big deal. It impacted relationships. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, the very first thing they did was hide from God. 
right? And God comes looking for them going, hey, Adam and Eve, where are you? And they hid from God. Why? Because of their guilt and shame. And so once sin entered the world, there was this wedge that came between humans and God because of their sin nature. And then it didn't end there, though. It impacted their relationship with one another, because in the book of Genesis, it says up until this point, Adam and Eve were naked and they were not ashamed of it. And next thing you know, and these are two married people, by the way, the next thing you know, they're hiding and sewing fig leaves together because they're hiding their nakedness from each other. And there is this guilt and shame now that comes in between them and their relationship will never be the same either. And so sin has marred in a great way and, and caused that. Now listen, in every relational problem that is damaged in our lives, the, the reason for it is sin. And you probably don't need to argue with that too much because listen, you may not have called it sin, but you call it by something else. Either somebody wronged you or you wronged them or you guys have wronged each other. But every relational problem is centered around those three things and that's sin. That's why we, we struggle with this. And this is why love is all messed up. And yet even though love is all messed up, what do we do? We, we clamor for it. We still desire it in our lives. We still look for it. You know, one great songwriter said it this way, you might as well face it, you're addicted to love, right? <laughs> like that is really the issue in our lives. And so when we find as we read throughout the New Testament is that every single author deals with this important concept of love in the Christian life. Every believer. In fact, it is so important for Jesus that he defined it as being the single most characteristic for the church in letting the world know that we're different from them. And so look what he says in John 13, 35. He says, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. I mean, do you really get the impact and in, in the weight of that? He's saying basically this. The world, when they look in and see the church and how they love each other, is the greatest testimony of the work of salvation in your life. That Jesus really has the power and the ability to transform your life. The greatest testimony of that is how you and I actually love each other. It's not how we argue the gospel. It's not how smart we are. It's not, not what we can do in apologetics. It's actually how we treat one another and how we show one another love. And so today we're going to talk about God's kind of love because, again, his love is greater than the kind of love we see displayed in the world. And, and every one of us has room to grow in this. So in this passage that we're going to split into two weeks, Paul actually lays out 20 different characteristics of love. And so we're going to look at the first group today. And, and I'll just be honest, I hate lists, but they're there in the Bible sometimes. And so we're, we're going to walk through these. I think like some of them we're going to walk through faster than the others because um, they're just, to me, more self-explanatory. And others ones we're going to dig in deeper. And it starts off in verse 9 with this. Love must be sincere. Now, I know that sounds kind of simple, but there's more here than kind of meets the eye when we dig into it. And part of that is found in, to, in this word sincere. And what does that word mean? And it actually... Uh, is comes from the Latin word sincerus, which means without wax. And the story about how this term came to really be is, is what happened in early Rome. And, and so there'd be people who would be selling like pottery and dishes and stuff. And uh, there'll be, all of a sudden a crack would come on it. And they're like, well, they didn't want anybody to know and they wanted to sell it for full price. So what they did was they would take a, a little bit of wax that was the same color and they would, they would melt it in there and smooth it out and polish it up so that it looked like it was perfect. And then the person would come in, they would buy it, and then they get home, and all of a sudden it wouldn't hold water <laughs> well, because it was broken. But it would be too, wait, too late, and they had already, it's, it's theirs, okay? And so what buyers began to do is the smart buyers would, would go in, they would examine a pot, and they would look, oh, do I really want this one? And then they would take it outside, and they would just kind of hold it up to the sun for a few moments. And listen, if there is wax there, it would start to melt and expose that crack. And they would know, I don't want this pot. And so that's what they would do. Now listen, the sellers who were really honest people, they would mark, they, they would test 
their pottery and all of that, and they would mark it sincerus without wax. And you would know, like, you could buy this piece of pottery and it would be fine. And so what Paul is really teaching us is that the love we have for one another, that love should be sincere. It should be not a broken kind of love, a love without wax, a love that is unbroken. He's saying that in the context of the love we should have for one another. I kind of like the way the New Living Translation puts it. It says, don't just pretend to love others, really love them. Because let's be honest, it's easy to pretend you love somebody. It's another thing to actually really love them. And, and eventually, when you pretend and you're around a person long enough, guess what? Those cracks are going to come out and it's going to show that you really don't love them the way you're pretending to love them. And so the church is not immune to this either. I mean, how often have you run into somebody who said, you know, I went to church and those people, they just judged me, they didn't like me, and and I didn't feel welcome there at all. And so I got out of there, I've never been back to a church since. You know, like you hear this, and it shouldn't be the case. Now, with that said, I kind of want to brag a little bit on a church because I'm really excited to hear this. Last week at the end of the second service, somebody came in to talk to me, and they weren't in the church service. And when they walked in, um, this person just told me, like, all these people greeted me, they welcomed me, they smiled at me, they talked to me, and they were just blown away by this, and they said, they're going to come visit now, an actual service, because they were loved and welcomed and not just overlooked. And so it is a big deal when we do this. That that just kind of shows you how big of a deal it is. And so I think Paul starts here with pretending to love one another because really in some ways, pretending you love somebody is almost worse than just flat out rejecting somebody. I mean, have you ever been in a relationship where somebody pretended to love you and then they dump you and then you realize they just pretended the whole time? Like you wish they wouldn't have even started, right? It it hurts worse than if they didn't even begin a relationship with you. And so I think Paul addresses this so that we don't get into this. Now, listen, the most challenging part of love is that it's easy to say and it's hard to back up, right? It is, especially since loving people in God's eyes means loving all people. So that like means, you know, that annoying person, (laughs) you got to love them, right? That means the person that hurts you, God says you got to love them. That means that person that you just don't like, but you can't figure out why, but you know there's just something not right. Like, yeah, that person, God wants you to love them. And so if we're honest, every one of us has somebody in our life, and probably more than one, that we just struggle to love the way God tells us to love. And so the question is, as Christians, how can we take what Paul is saying and saying, love needs to be sincere and live this out? Because it's a lot harder than it, it sounds like. We, we, yeah, I have sincere love. Let's move on. No, do we really? So how do we do that? And I think there's two things I want to point out that are really rooted in our salvation experience that we need to recognize as we're trying to fulfill this. The very first one takes us back to what Paul taught us in Romans chapter 5, verse 5. I know it's been a while, so let's take a look at it. It says, For we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. Now listen, he's saying this. Those of you who have an experience of God's love in your life, guess what? You have the Holy Spirit in your life filling your hearts with his love. And I just love this. I say this a lot, but God never tells you to do something he doesn't empower you to do. And he's given you the Holy Spirit to empower you to love somebody that is difficult for you to love. You have the Holy Spirit inside of you if you're saved who has given you the ability to love others. He's not asking you to do it on your own. Now listen, there's a second part that I think can help us as well, and we find it in the story found in Matthew 18 of of the man forgiven the 10,000 talents. And for some of you, this may be a familiar story, but I kind of want to walk through it again because, listen, the king calls in a guy who owes 10,000 talents and says, hey, it's time for you to pay up. And what does the guy do? He begs for a little bit more time. And the king does something incredible. Instead of giving him more time, he flat out forgives the entire debt. Now, as I was studying this this week, 
um, there were some parallels that were made that, that really paint a picture of just the type of debt he was forgiven. Let me give you some comparison. We know he had 10,000 10, talents in debt. It's not $10,000, by the way. It's much more than that. King Herod was an incredibly wealthy king of Israel, and his yearly income was 900 talents a year. And so think about this. He's incredibly wealthy, incredibly rich, bringing in 900 talents a year. If he put everything he had into paying off that debt and didn't live off of anything, he would have 11 plus years before that debt would be paid off. It was just a stunning amount. Or to put it in a greater perspective, the entire tax revenue for all of Israel was only 200 talents a year. That's all the taxes coming in from this country, 200 talents a year. It would take 50 years to pay off that debt if every bit of tax revenue came in. And the important thing that Jesus was trying to communicate was clearly this. You have a debt that is way over your head that you could never pay in your whole entire lifetime. It's beyond your ability. And really, that's what he's wanting to communicate to us about our sin. Our sin is so great. That sin debt is so great that we couldn't pay it off if we had our whole lifetime to pay it off. We could never pay it off. And so there's an important part in the story, though. There's a, a very important detail that's missing in the story that when you think about it, it's stunning because here's this guy in the court of the king and the king forgives his debt that he could never pay, shows mercy on him. The guy never even says thank you. Have you ever noticed that that's missing in the story? He never even like, hey, thanks, king. You know what it says? It says he immediately left the king's courthouse and he went and he bumped into a guy who owed him 100 talents of silver, which is really, it wasn't 100 talents, it was 100 denarius of silver, which ends up being about 100 days of wages. So it's, it's a manageable debt. It's a debt nonetheless, but it's manageable. And he starts demanding payment from this guy and choking him and say, pay up, pay up. And he can't. And he begs for patience just like he had just a few moments earlier with the king. And he refuses and throws the guy in prison. And this gets back to the king. And he's furious now and pulls him back in. And look what he says in verse 32 through 34 to this guy. You wicked servant, he said, I canceled all the debts of yours because you begged me to. Now, shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? And in anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. And you and I are listening to this story and we're cheering, right? We're like, yeah, he's getting what he deserves because he is wicked and evil. And then Jesus turns around to the crowd and says this. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. I know you're kind of thinking, well, I thought we were talking about love. Why are we mixing love and forgiveness? And it's really because of this. If we have claimed, you and I, to have experienced the extravagant love and forgiveness that God has poured out on our lives, and that then you and I should actually have a sweetness about how we interact with the world around us. Like there should be a difference. When we receive this extravagant love and forgiveness and then turn around and treat other people like they don't deserve it, you know what we actually act like? We act like we deserve our flaws to be forgiven, but they don't. And that's really a flawed thinking. And we're just we're really not embracing the incredible gift of everything that we have been forgiven because if we are, if we're touched by that, then there is no way it can't spill over into the lives of other people. And so that next time you're with that uh, annoying person <laughs> that you're struggling to love, don't just pretend you love them in a hypocritical way. Start honestly with repentance. Start with going, God, forgive me for my unkind heart towards this person right now and ask God to change your heart for not being blown away by the love he's extravagantly poured out on your life that you didn't deserve. In other words, get back to the awe of what really changed your life. You didn't really wake up one day and go, hey, I want God and then clean yourself up and then everything's good now. No, you had a debt that was incalculable that you couldn't pay 
And God is coming and wiped that out. And if he did it for you, then guess what he wants to do for the world around us? And so we understand that what we have is such an amazing gift of mercy. And on top of that, we couple that with the gift of the Holy Spirit that is now in my life that gives me the ability to love others. And that's how we love others in a sincere manner. And then it goes on to say this in verse 9, hate what is evil and cling to what is good. Listen, our love needs to be grounded in God's truth because if it's not, then it's not genuine love. And this is really important for us to understand because one of our biggest struggles is really that we care about people and because we care about people so deeply, we lose our sense of what is right and wrong with them. It happens all the time. We've seen so many so many parents especially who they, they love their kids and their kids start doing things that are ungodly and because they care about them, they let go of the truth and embrace whatever they're doing. And listen, you do that because you want them to be happy, right? Well, I want them to be happy. But listen, real love hates what is evil. And the reason why it hates what is evil is because it knows what going down that path of evil is going to lead to, and that's destruction in their lives. And so a love that won't warn against the dangers of evil ultimately isn't any love at all. In fact, quite honestly, I know this might sting a little bit, but when you won't tell somebody the truth, you're not being motivated by love. You're actually being motivated by your own comfort. I'm not wanting to stir the nest. You're, you're being motivated by your fear of them walking out on you. You want their approval more than you care about loving them, being, being honest. And so we need to remember that it's important that we have this genuine love that's anchored in the truth. Now listen, we all have blind spots, right? Every single one of us has blind spots. And when you have a blind spot, you need somebody who's willing to tell you the truth. It's kind of like this. <laughs> Anybody ever have this happen? You're in your car and someone comes driving up and they're like, hey, roll down your window. And you're like, I don't know if I want to do that. But you roll down your window and they're like, hey, your tail light's out, right? And you're like, well, I didn't know that. Thank you for telling me. Why didn't you know it? Because you can't see back there, right? It's a blind spot. And so somebody had to tell you for you to make the change. And you're thankful because guess what? Now you don't have to get a ticket, right? Now you don't have to go to court and prove that you fixed it. And so you're thankful for somebody telling you the truth that your car needs to be repaired. Well, the same thing needs to be true for our lives. And I know that's oversimplifying it because sometimes you tell people the truth and, and they bite your head off, right? They're not thankful that you're helping them avoid a problem. But it's still what we need to do is we're, we're motivated by this. Now listen, the challenge within this is that you've heard the statement, you love the sinner but hate the sin, right? And, and I, I know that that is such a true statement, but here's my caution with that is within that is, is it's easier to say I love the sinner but I hate the sin and you equate sin and sinner so closely together and that you now really, there's no distinction between the two. And that's a big challenge. And so I think it's easier said than done, but listen, we're called to do that. We're called to love the sinner, but hate the sin. The big question is, is do we actually hate sin? Like, I don't mean like you just like sin. The Bible says you hate it. And over and over in scripture, there are certain things we're called to hate and it's sin and evil. And there, there are some scriptures that we really rise to this level. Let me give you two. Psalm 97, 10 says, Let those who love the Lord, what's that word? Hate evil. In Proverbs 8, 13, To fear the Lord is to hate evil, and to hate pride and arrogance and evil behavior and perverse speech. And really, if you look at the scriptures that talk about our hatred for evil, it is rooted in our closeness with God. The closer you get to God, the more you're going to have this hatred towards what is evil. And the reason why you hate evil is because you see its destructive nature. You know it's not of God. You realize that holiness is what we're called to, and anything that is evil is not even close to being holy. That's why we can't tolerate evil. 
And so we hate what is evil in the person, yet Paul makes sure we temper this by telling us what? Cling to what is good. Cling to what is good in that person. Every person has some good in them. Some of us, we just have to look a lot harder for others than some, right? But there's good there. Why? Because they were created in the image and likeness of God. They're actually image bearers of God. And so God has within them something good. And there's a reflection of that even before they're saved. That's why unsaved people still can be good people. They still are image bearers of God. There just is a brokenness within that that God wants to heal. And so one of our jobs is to look, and the word cling literally means to glue. And so we should be looking for every way we can help people glue themselves to the goodness of God. That's what we should be doing, because whatever God calls good, that is what we should cling to. And we should believe just wholeheartedly this incredible truth. John 8, 32, then you will know the truth and the truth will what? It's gonna set you free. The reason why we want people to know the truth is because we know the bondage of evil and sin and we want them to be set free. And this is the power of the gospel at work in their lives. But only, only truly loving somebody with the truth will bring them to this understanding of what God wants to do in their lives. You're never going to get people to come to Christ lying to them. Doesn't that sound foolish? And yet that's what some of us try to do. We try to lie to them and think like someday maybe they'll like God enough. And it's just a, such a false notion. Listen, he goes on to say this in verse 10, love one another deeply as brothers and sisters. And so the love that you and I should have for one another should be like this love we have in our families. And maybe I should say in a healthy family because <laughs> some of us haven't had that healthy family experience. But in a healthy family, the way love works is the way God wants it to work. And I want to paint, paint some pictures of some things that really stand out of the type of love that happens in a really godly, loving family. I was thinking about when my brother went away to college. Uh, he went to a secular university, got caught up on the campus in some cult. And they came in and, and they really kind of did a number on him, pulled him away from God. He's in a cult and he's really in just, it's really a religious cult, but it's a cult nonetheless. And, you know, our family didn't go, well, so long. <laughs> Good luck to you. No, our family fought in prayer even harder for him than any other time in our lives probably. And we stuck it and we were there for him through it all, um, even to the other end of it, till he got out. But we didn't run from him because he had a problem. Some of you, you maybe even are experiencing something like this, where you know, your parents are getting to this age where they can't handle life themselves. And we're called as Christians, what? To then, to be there, to provide, to help, them and not turn their back on them and take care of them every way we can. That's what we're called to do. That's what godly family does. It, it, it takes care of their parents. We're told that. You know, if your kid gets in trouble at school, you don't pull them aside and go, yeah, I called the police over here. They're coming to escort you out with all your stuff. We're done. No, you, you fight for your child. You help them, you get every help you can to, to help them get back on the right path. And what you find in a healthy, godly family is that there's this devotion to each other. You're devoted to each other. We put up with each other's faults. In fact, when one person in the family is dealing with a problem, it means like the whole family is dealing with that problem. Like that's what a godly family how they walk through life together. And Paul is saying this, that you're in it thick and thin, and this is the way the body of Christ is supposed to be. You're in it together. There's no one that's part of the body of Christ that should walk in and go, but that's your problem. Good luck on that, and you walk away. That shouldn't happen in his body. We're family, we should be caring for one another. We should, if you have a problem, then we have a problem, and we're gonna help you through it. And this is what Paul is saying the family of God is like. It is what you saw in the book of Acts, right? I mean, it's just stunning that they shared everything and had everything in common and nobody in their midst had any needs, right? 
there is just this powerful, stunning display of God's love at work, and yet that is the love we should have. Verse 10 goes on to say, outdo one another in showing honor. Listen, the God kind of love that you and I are called to is, is to show one another honor. And really, if you think about it, what most people tend to do is talk about themselves and all their accolades so that people give them a pat on the back. But the body of Christ should be different. You and I should be literally entering into church looking to pat others on the back. Hey, I see this and you're doing a great job over here. And and we show one another honor for, for who they are. And listen, it really shouldn't be that hard to do if we have a spiritual understanding of one another. Let me show you what I mean. Because this is super important. We've already talked about that every one of us bears the image of God, right? So we're image bearers of God. That should be huge. We don't look at each other just as what's on the surface. This is, some, this is part of who God is. And we should have a respect and honor of that. But think about this. Every single believer in this room has been purchased with the highest price ever paid for something, the blood of Jesus. Like every single one of us is a blood-bought person of the Father. Like you have that much value in the sight of God. Now add to that this. Every believer in this room has the spirit of the living God inside of them. And one day the Bible says that even the least of us is going to rule and reign with Christ. And if that is the case, how can we look down on anybody that is in their midst? We should be looking for who they are in Christ, and they have extreme value. If they have extreme value in God's eyes, then they should have extreme value in our eyes. And that should be really easy for us to see, but we, we don't think about that. We don't look at people and go, hey, you're blood-bought the blood of Jesus, you have that much value. And if this is the case of who we really are, then there should be no issue of us treating one another with honor and and bestowing that upon one another. Then we're going to move a little bit faster through the last couple ones because of time. But Romans 12, 11 through 12 goes on to say, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. I know there's six different commands here, and we could spend a great deal of time on every one of them, but uh, we just don't have that amount of time. But they're all rooted in really loving other people and our, our anchor, our trust and anchor being in God and his promises. I mean, these things are, are really anchored in those things. The first three things talk about our zeal and spiritual fervor and serving the Lord. Listen, one of the marks of a growing Christian is that we should be filled with an enthusiasm for God. Like, it should be part of who every one of us are. We shouldn't have these lackadaisical Christians who have no emotions whatsoever. <laughs> we should be enthusiastic with God. And, and you might think, how does that show love for other people? Well, enthusiasm rubs off. And when you're enthusiastic for God, you actually propel those around you to be more enthusiastic for God. This is one of the most loving things you can do and you didn't even know you are doing it. <laughs> and this happened a couple weeks ago in our church. I mean, in the first service, my wife came with our kids and we were singing that song, The Battle Belongs to the Lord. And our kids love that song. And all of a sudden I looked up and, and they were sitting over back here and Levi and Hannah are like dancing around, they're swinging, Hannah's pointing up at God, you know, and, and like anybody that saw that, all of a sudden you were just like, wow, and you're drawn in, there's this enthusiasm based off of their worshiping God. And, you know, it just reminded me about how little kids lead you to the presence and throne room of God. That happens because of their enthusiasm. It was infectious to those around them. And what I want you to get is when you're enthusiastic about God, it's infectious. Other people are drawn into it. And it's just simply as you serve God, it's, it's, it's fueling that passion over onto others. It rubs off. The second three things talk about being joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. Listen, the reason why we can encourage people to be faithful in hope, to have this hope when 
they're going through a sense of hopelessness is because our hope is in the Lord. We know that we are worshiping a God who all of his promises are what? Yes and amen, right? So our, our hope is in the promises of God, that God is going to do what he said he's going to do, and we can bank on that. And we're going to point people to that. What you're going through, don't. You have hope in Jesus. And that's our anchor. The reason we can encourage somebody to be patient in affliction is because we have the promise of Jesus. 2 Corinthians 4.17 says, For our light affl- affliction which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. We don't ignore that people are being afflicted and going through afflictions of this life. But listen, we point to a greater hope that whatever afflictions you're going through right now in your life is actually creating a greater glory in eternity with Christ. And so there is a purpose that God is using in your affliction. And if you know there's a purpose in it, then you can get through it. We're faithful in prayer because we're told to pray about everything. Why do we pray about everything? Because we believe there's a God who hears and cares about all the things that are on our hearts. And so Philippians 4, 6 says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. And so all of this loving others in a way that points them to the hope of Jesus is rooted in our trust in God's promises. We know and we trust like God. If he says it, he's going to follow through and we believe it. And so we can live enthusiastic, serving God. We can help people have hope, even in affliction. And we can pray for people. And those are incredibly powerful displays of love. Well, listen, one last one that we're going to look at before we close. And this is our love should be expressed in tangible ways. We see this in verse 13. It says, share with the Lord's people who are in need and practice hospitality. And I know at first reading, it looks like it's the same thing, but most scholars believe that it's a, when it says share with the Lord's people, it's talking about our body. But when it says show hospitality, it's talking about the people outside the walls of the church. And we're to do both. I think the order is important. I think we should be looking for ways, again, to serve one another in love and to help one another out. If you're going through something and and you're facing it, you shouldn't have to face it alone. You're part of a body, and and we're here to help one another out. And and love should be tangible. The second area, though, is that it is to spill outside of our church into those around us. And I'm really excited because I know like there's some things on the horizon that we're trying to get up and going so that this, this does happen and that we are going outside of these walls. I mean, right before COVID happened, we were ready to jump into some, some uh, opportunities to reach our community, some projects, and then it happened and then boom, it's like it was all shut down. And honestly, as we get ready to, to restart looking at ways of engaging our community. We're having to rethink a whole lot of stuff because it just doesn't look the same as it used to and we have to be mindful of that. So we're trying to figure out what's gonna even work. But we know we're called to have whatever God has done in our life spill over into our community and the people outside of these walls. And so we're looking to see that happen in our midst. Now listen, we looked at a long list of what love looks like from God's perspective. My guess is that there's some area that might stand out to you and you're like, yeah, I'm not too good on that one. But just as we, since we walked through so many, let me recap. We went, went through six things. Let me just recap them briefly. It says love must be sincere. That's the first one we looked at. The second one is, is love hates evil and clings to what is good. The third one is, is that love should feel like family. And the fourth one is, is love should outdo showing, others, showing honor to others. And the fifth one is is our love should be rooted in our trust in God and his promises. And finally, love should be expressed in tangible ways. Well, if you're finding yourself falling short in any of those, I want to remind you of what we said in the beginning. And that is this. We have the power of the Holy Spirit in work in our lives, helping us to love as God has called us to love. In no way do I think we should ever hear a message preached from the Bible and think, well, I need to try harder on that. Because that is your greatest path to frustration. 
God never tells us to do anything in our own strength and our own power. He does tell us, like, listen, hey, if you're not doing this, the path is what? Repentance and prayer, right? We repent and we pray, God, help me. And then we learn to allow the Holy Spirit now to work these things through our lives. And so if there's an area of your life that you feel like, hey, I'm just falling short in, the first act for us is to repent and tell God I'm sorry and I messed up and the next thing is to pray for the strength to do it and then the next is simply this I guarantee that if you repent over something and you tell God you want to do better at it this week God is going to give you an opportunity to do better at it something's going to happen in your life and an opportunity is going to come and guess what this time you're going to be ready to to learn from the Holy Spirit and to do things in the spirit and not in your flesh this time And so you're going to find a victory in this because you're going to be trusting in the power of the Spirit of God at work in your life. Just remember this, that the stakes are high for getting getting this right. Remember, Jesus said our greatest testimony is how we love one another. And listen, that's not optional. You can't opt out of that clause. I'm a Christian, I just don't want to love. No, we don't get to do that. Well, listen, maybe you're here and the description we just walked through of love is, is like really captivating. You're like, man, I would love to experience that kind of love. And maybe you walked in kind of like Adam and Eve, kind of hiding from God in a sense because you know your own guilt and your own shame. The good news is, is listen, just like Adam and Eve hid from God, God came looking for them. And I want you to know that God has come looking for you today and he's calling out to you because he wants to save you from your guilt and your your sin. You are created in his image and more than anything, he wants you to know his love and his goodness. Because when you experience his love and, and his goodness, it's stunning. There's nothing that even will ever come close to changing your life. With, other than experiencing that. And that is the opportunity that is here today and why I believe God just might have brought you here through our doors so that you can experience that today. Would you bow your heads? Let's pray today. God, thank you for your word. And thank you for the scriptures that we've walked through today. And I thank you for, Lord, your stunning love, God. Many of us in this room, we, we, we've received that, God. And yet, if we're honest, we haven't been impacted by it in, in the degree of everything that you've done, the debt you've wiped out in our lives. We just haven't been blown away by that, God. And we need to be Jesus. And so I pray, God, that, Lord, you would just start in our hearts first, God. God, we repent for taking your grace and your mercy for granted. And we repent for not allowing your Holy Spirit to love through us, those around us, God. But God, I pray that this week would be different. This week could be a week where... God, your spirit is setting us up to love like you love. And that, Lord Jesus, people wouldn't be able to walk away and deny what a great love it is, God. And so I pray that this would be a week of victory in our lives, uh, not for ourselves, but for you, for your honor and your glory. And I thank you that your spirit would lovingly correct us and to change us. Listen, if you're in this room and, and maybe again that description of love is stunning and you're like, you know, I, I just want it. I never experienced a love like that. And you just really sense God drawing your heart to him today. Could I just lead you in a prayer of receiving Christ and the salvation that he has for you and the love that he wants to pour out on you today? Would you just pray with me? Jesus, God, I come to you, Lord, with all of my flaws, all of my sins. 
God, completely imperfect, with a debt I can't pay. And Lord, I thank you that in Jesus you took away all that sin and you paid the penalty for it all, God. And so Lord, I, I thank you and I just pray that you would just save my life today and that you would shower your love upon me and that I would know extravagant love and mercy of Jesus in my life. And Lord, from this day forward, I want to live and honor you and please you for the great gift of mercy and grace that you've given me today. And I thank you for that. In Jesus' name. So if you prayed that, I just want to encourage you to let someone know before you leave because we really would love the chance and the opportunity to share the next steps in following Christ. And we just want to get you a Bible as well. And so if that's you, let somebody know today before you leave. scripture to share this morning psalms 105 1 through 4 give thanks to the lord call on his name make known among the nations what we what he has done sing to him sing praise to him tell of all his wonderful acts glory in his holy name let the hearts of those who seek the lord rejoice yes look to the lord and his strength seek yes, his face always yes lord we seek your face lord we need your strength lord Satan fall like lightning. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. Thank you, Lord. I believe in signs and wonders. Resurrection power Still the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven Oh my praise is yes, to you forever Sing it out This is my testimony From death to life Cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Come together. Come together, sons and daughters. Bought with blood and washed in water. Praises of the Spirit, Son, and Father. Our God will finish what He started. Yes, our God will finish what He started. Hallelujah. This is my testimony from death to life. Because grace rewrote my story. I'll testify. By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my this is my testimony. This is my testimony. From death to life. Because grace rewrote my story. I'll testify. By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Now, if I'm not dead, you're not done. Think about that. He has a lot to go. Your things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Thank you, Lord. Greater things are still to come. If I'm not dead, you're not done. The greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. Sing it now. This is my testimony.
testimony from death to life. Her grace rewrote my story. I'll testify. By Jesus Christ, the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. I'll testify. Yes, Lord. Because grace rewrote my story. I'll testify. By Jesus Christ the righteous, I am justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Sing it now. If I'm not dead, you're not done, Lord. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Sing it. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. The greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. The greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. The greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. This is my testimony. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify. For Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. Oh, I'm alive. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify. Jesus Christ the righteous, I am justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Hallelujah. Give him thanks today, yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. This is my testimony. death to life from death to life I was just thinking as we get ready to take communion today you know when was the last time that we just that we just thank God for the gift of grace that we have received we just said thank you I mean, it's so easy to take for granted the grace that we have received in our lives. And yet, quite honestly, this is the greatest gift any one of us has, has ever received. And yet, we need to make sure we have times of gratitude where we just say thank you. As we take communion today, I just pray that we would have that thought pervading this whole time of being at his table. We're thanking God for everything he's done for us. The Bible says, on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread. And after the supper, he lifted up the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. It's the blood that's been shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. And every time you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the cup together. Jesus, we just say thank you, God. Thank you for the stunning display of your grace and love. God, thank you that I'm a blood-bought child of God. That my life was purchased at a stunning price, God. And I thank you for that, God. And I pray that I'd be able to 
really walk differently this week seeing those around me as deserving honor and love and respect God and so I pray that this week would be a week that just is different because I'm different and I've recognized all that I have been given in you Jesus and so I give you praise I give you glory for that in Jesus name Amen Thank you Lord Thank you Jesus we worship you Lord all across this earth Lord let your name be lifted high Lord today we join with all creation Lord the trees of the field clap their hands is what your word says Lord the mountains skip with joy before you, Lord. The seas and the oceans rise up, Lord, to bless your name. Hallelujah. For all the creation suddenly articulate with the thousand tongues to lift one cry. Then from north to south and east We'd hear Christ be magnified. Were the whole earth echoing his eminence, his name would burst from sea and sky, from rivers to the mountain tops. We'd hear Christ be magnified. Let us let it ring, church. Oh, Christ be magnified. Let his praise arise. Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my Every creature finds its inmost melody. When every human heart is native cry, and then in one enraptured hymn of praise, we'll sing Christ be magnified. Sing it now. Worship you if it puts me in the fire. Rejoice that you're there too. I won't be bored by feelings. I hold fast to what is true. If the cross brings transformation, I'll be crucified with you. Cause death is just the doorway to resurrection life. And if I join you in your sufferings, then I'll join you when you rise, and we will return in glory with all the angels and the saints, 
my heart will still be singing my song will be the same above all things God we pray a blessing next week we'll be wrapping up chapter 12 and so we invite you back it is 4th of July but uh, we'll still have a, a great time in his word together so but may the Lord bless you may God keep you may he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you may God grant you his peace amen and God bless